Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Carrie Burkle, and I am the co founder of Textile Arts Los Angeles and also the Southern California Regional Rep of the Surface Design Association, a membership, a nonprofit focused, a membership nonprofit focused on contemporary fiber and textile art. I'm delighted to welcome you to this week's textile talk, the fusion of fiber, arts, fashion, and design with featured artists. Don Q. Kim and Lisa Rich. Textile Talks webinars are brought to you by our many sponsors and members like you. Before we begin the presentation today, first, a few housekeeping announcements. This is a webinar and your screens and mics are not showing. We welcome questions, which we'll answer at the end of all of the artist presentations. Please submit them in the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. We are honored to bring you free and inspiring Textile Talks programming. We respectfully ask you to be courteous as you engage with speakers, moderators, and other participants. Your chat comments can be seen by everyone. Please use the Q&A for questions, chat box for greeting others, and survey for commentary or ways we can improve. And now I'd like to give you an overview of the presentation. This textile talk explores the intersection of fashion and art, fiber and mixed media artist, Lisa Rich, discusses how she transitioned from fiber artist to fashion designer. To the present, her passion for fashion still continues in our art practice today in the form of wearable art pieces, which he calls body sculptures. Dong Q Kim explores how the fashion and art markets are embracing and emerging with one another since the Louis Vuitton and Supreme collaboration um, in 2017. Currently a fashion design director at First Row, as well as a practicing textile artist, Kim brings valuable insight on the current and future of art, fashion, and design selected for the fusion of fine to reading. Our first presenter today is Lisa Rich. Lisa Rich is an experimental visual, visual artist who transforms a variety of materials in unique ways using techniques that include free motion stitching, a method of painting and building texture using sewing thread on a sewing machine, and dyeing, painting, melting, sculpting, heat transferring, hand embroidery, 3D printing, laser cutting, resin casting, and much, much more. Rich has a Master of Fine Arts, Bachelor of Fine Arts, and Bachelor of Education and Arts degree, and art degrees. She has exhibited in notable museums, galleries, and art centers, and has been featured in many televised interviews. Her work is published in numerous books, magazines, and online. She writes, reviews, and articles for national and international magazines, and has recently published a children's book and a series of how-to art books. She has taught art for 47 years. Rich has artworks in the permanent collections of Delta Airlines, Hilton Hotels, Emory Healthcare, Emory Women's Health, the CAM Foundation, the Dallas Museum of Art, the University of Texas, the University of North Texas, the works Atlanta and in private collections across the US, Canada and the EU. She is a 2019 recipient of a distinguished fellowship, Fulton County Arts Council, Atlanta, Georgia, USA. Lisa Rich recently moved back to her home country, Canada and lives and works on a quiet rural island in Ontario that is accessible only by ferry. Rich's 2022 exhibitions have included a feature installation at Stantec Architecture, Toronto, 
a juried exhibition at Modern Fuel at the Tet Kingston, Ontario, a solo exhibition at Mac Gallery, um, Guanaco, Ontario, and she was a finalist in the Umbra Design Competition, Design TO. She's included in an upcoming exhibition at the Art Gallery of Mississauga. So um, Astrid, you are sharing Lisa's screen. So Lisa, please take it away. Hello, everyone. Today, I'm going to trace my path from the 1970s to the present in the fusion of fiber arts, fashion, and design. Next slide. In 1965, as you can read, I was sent home for drawing nudes by Sister Mary at the Catholic high school I attended. My parents had to explain that I was just drawing the wallpaper that was in our bathroom. But recently when I was pulling up this image, I noted that I actually think I drew a dress on this particular girl. So I think her breasts are on top of her dress. So I think I was, I can get off halfway here. But that was just the beginning of what ended up being a really interesting life and a very cheeky and often misunderstood connection to the arts. Next. After private high school, I attended Interlochen Arts Academy in Upper Michigan from 1975 to 1978 and switched from music and dance to art due to a, a fluke. I attended there for uh, weaving during 1977 and 78. And when I got out of, inter of Interlochen and uh, then I went to the University of Michigan for my BFA in fiber arts, I was weaving these large sculptural works. And of course, in a small town in Canada, that didn't go off very well. I didn't sell very many of the works. So next slide. I turned my attention to weaving intricate sweaters that were embellished, each one a one of a kind, and found some success in that area in sales. I had always had a little bit of an interest in fashion, but what I really wanted to do was bring some sort of an artistic element to the human body. Next slide. Shortly after a couple of years of uh, going it alone, I talked my way into a job with Norma, which was a knit leather and fur company, an international company based in Toronto, who did, uh, they did embellished sweaters and clothing and a line of belts and hats. And the best experience I had there after literally talking my way into this job as a designer with no fashion design school experience, the best experience was that I got from the production the production uh, employees who took me under their wings and taught me how to run a sewing machine, industrial sewing machines and industrial sergers and cutters. And the leather guy taught me how to, to differentiate different kinds of leathers and suede and how to cut them. Just a lot of really valuable experience. And also in the area of production, how to do things fast but yet really to the best of my ability. Next slide. I went from there, uh, left Toronto, as by that time I was married and had a child and moved to another small city in, in Ontario, Canada, and started a hat design, jewelry design and wearable art business, which uh, was quite successful. And my works were purchased and sold in 125 stores across Canada, the US and Germany. And they were featured on television shows. And they, it was really satisfying. Um, I was able to do them as one of a kinds, but I reached a fork in the road where I really had to confront, did I want to go into mass production or did I want to do, continue to do one of a kind on a small basis? Next slide. It was at that time that we actually relocated with the kids, two kids by this time, to Kauai, Hawaii. And it was a painter that I met there who admonished me for just doing um, artware and selling some clothing. She had seen my art portfolio from the earlier years, and she suggested that I 
take that talent and that interest, but that I return back to my non-functional roots. So these pieces were done during those couple of years on Kauai when I tried to meld uh, my art and sculpture, love of sculpture and three-dimensional three into uh, wearables that were borderline between the two disciplines. Next slide. I took, then we moved to Dallas, Texas, and I took those ideas and began to depart further from the wearable art aspect. And these, this, this installation of uh, sculptural elements was one of the better pieces from those days called the three muses with the hope and despair boxes. They were really when I was incorporating a lot of mixed media and branching out to incorporate encaustic wax, sculptural elements, uh, vacuum forming of plastics, my free motion machine embroidery, things really began to come together at that time. Next slide. And these are details of the two hope and despair boxes and uh, the digital image transfers that I did were then embellished with free motion machine embroidery as well as dyes. Next slide. Again, addressing the, the two, straddling those two areas between art and fashion, art and the human body, that fusion, this piece began to depart even further from the three muses into a, even more of a sculptural area and with stronger conceptual statements. This is called What a Man Wants. And the breastplate is actually made out of layers of eggshell. Next slide. From there, I continued on into those areas of uh, strong concepts, social concepts, philosophical concepts, political. And the piece on the left uh, addressed female genital mutilation or FGM. I was teaching high school by this time in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. And I had a student come to me the day after, a 15 year old student, the day after her grandmother had performed FGM on her and it made a massive impact on me. And I realized at that time, I had been doing it for a long time, but how important art was and sculpture and my fiber arts background was in helping to create a strong statement that would impact the viewer in some way. The piece on the right addresses dense breast tissue in breast cancer uh, survivors. My mother was a breast cancer survivor and uh, that piece um, has uh, employs wax and fabric, free motion stitching, hand knitted wire, as well as silicone. Next slide. I lightened up a little bit shortly thereafter and did a comical series based on vintage, vintage comics that was called um, No Sense Crying Over Spilled Milk. And these pieces were free motion machine embroidery and mixed media on vinyl. And then the piece on the right, again, incorporates the human body. And this was just the a three panel, triple panel piece that did have uh, two other components to it that had the rest of the human body. But as you can say, this is, uh, see, this is the brain and the head. Next. Just shortly before, literally right before COVID hit, in fact, I had to send somebody uh, racing to Coastal Carolina State University to take down my exhibition. Uh, I had been working for some years uh, with stronger incorporation of the viewer as a participant into my work. And the one on the left is the Coastal Carolina show in which everything was viewer interactive. There were pieces you could pull off the wall, things you could rearrange, toys to play with, and a garden you could swing in. And the one on the right has a contortionist in the inset. Uh, I created the bodysuit, which also had free motion machine embroidered veins over the face and placed her into a large installation from which she rose and performed. So in that piece, especially, I think you can see how I melded 
uh, that art with the uh, fashion and the human body. Next. And this piece is made out of foss shape, uh, which is what I've written the, the so far three part series of, of books on uh, how to use foss shape. And it's a material that's in your car that I have been working with for a number of years. And these are breast like, uh, ligament like. So again, uh, he, you know, referencing that human body, but placing it onto the wall and having it be a, an ever changing uh, installation that goes on the wall. Sometimes it's been on the floor. It morphs and changes through time. Next. In uh, 19, or sorry, 2018, I was diagnosed with uh, severe melanoma and I lost a huge chunk of my face and had several surgeries and two plastic surgeries. And this exhibition, which was a solo exhibition, was the, at the end of that process and everything in it was stitched and sliced and diced and things put back together again. And of course the pink does reference breast, or sorry, cancer survivors. Next. Now, I really love to take my piece and to incorporate them with others in any way possible. And this is the performance troupe Liquid Sky and uh, one of their performances. They're based out of Atlanta and I did a few things with them, collaborations. Next. And then this one, these uh, are those booties that workers put on their feet or hospital workers put on their feet. And there are thousands of them that are stitched together in a statement that uh, addresses uh, abuse of women and objectification. Next. Oh, I should note that that last one is called uh, cat call booty call. This one, uh, has, uh, again, I'm returning and continuing with melding the artistic and the installation uh, and the viewer interaction, uh, all of those things. The piece on the right is uh, particularly interesting, I think, um, because I have taken the bones of the human body and then I have just uh, stitched them, those bones onto white vinyl and then created the entire, uh, the entire coat. Next. Recently, as uh, was introduced, I moved to a remote island in Ontario, Canada, that's only accessible by ferry. There's no doctors, no retail. And I've been actually doing a body of work for about a year and a half that places animals instead of the human into different roles, uh, both of uh, humans versus animals and also animal versus animal as the deer and the coyote, foxes, et cetera, go through my property three plus acres pretty much every day. I'm right on the St. Lawrence River. So a lot of immersion right now in nature. Next. And then to end my slide presentation are the three works that are in the SDA uh, EIP. And so those works are um, I'm really excited to be included and I thank the SDA so much for this opportunity. And I hope that you'll all read the EIP on uh, the journal when it comes out because there will be an expanded explanation of each of these pieces. They all have a particular concept that I had in mind when I was making them. And uh, I hope that you all will read the journal and thank you so much for coming today. Lisa, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Mm -hmm. um, our next presenter is Don Q. Kim. And Don Q. Kim is a mixed media artist and fashion designer whose works are constructed of paper receipts tickets and other materials collected over the past 14 years since relocating to the United States. All his materials are sewn together by hand. Kim's work explores his relationships to the US, the concept of the American dream, and how individual lives are affected by transitions in global economic structures. 
Kim has exhibited in museums and galleries throughout the US. He recently received a 2021 New Jersey Individual Artist Fellowship Award from the New Jersey State Council on the Arts. And his work has received awards from many institutions, including the Florida State University Museum of Arts, Florida, Oklahoma State University, Oklahoma, Minot State University, North Dakota, and many others. He received a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in fashion design. And um, Kim, I'd like you to start your um, presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie, for um, introduction. <laughs> So can you see my uh, presentation? Uh, nope, not yet. Not yet, I'm sorry. Can you see that? Uh, yes, and then um, do the play slideshow so we see full screen. Sure. Perfect. Thank okay, you. thank you. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for, uh, thank you so much for your time and support today. Um, I'd like to thank Astrid and Carrie for giving me this wonderful um, opportunity. My name is Donggyu Kim. I am a fashion designer and a multimedia artist. I moved to the US in 2007 for my job and I lived in New Jersey for 14 years. Um, last year, 2021, I moved to LA, California. Uh, I currently, I work for um, Young Men's Street Brand First Row Denim. And Today, I want to discuss how U.S. fashion and art markets are accepting each other or merging each other. Um, before talking about that, I will explain about the Supreme brand. Supreme is a young man's American street brand, and their red box logo was selected the most powerful in the world in 2018. Also, the founder, ja uh, James Jebia, was named Manager Designer of the Year at the 2018 uh, CFC, uh, CFDA Awards. The brand was becoming as commercially successful as ever, all without increasing its supply or little to no marketing. The cult of Supreme was shifting from the, if you know, you know, skate community of 90s Soho to the droves of Instagram hypeists vlogging their weight in a drop line or flowing a month's rent on a resold hoodie. In case you guys want to know more about the Supreme phenomenon, please check the article of uh, Christy. Um, I will share the, web, uh, the link. And first of all, I need to talk about the co uh, collaboration between Supreme and Louis Vuitton. It was the first time that streetwear was taken seriously in the high fashion space. Uh, since Louis Vuitton and Supreme um, uh, since you know, since uh, Louis Vuitton and Supreme collaboration, the concept of fashion and art collaboration became the norm. Of course, there were many examples of expo uh, collaboration before their collaboration. Um, you, you guys already knew about the famous um, Yves Saint Laurent and Mondrian dress in the 60s. And uh, you, you guys will also remember uh, Louis Vuitton and Murakami Takashi's uh, colorful um, monogram. Uh, back in the early 2000s. Their collaboration achieved a, a huge commercial success. Um, after Louis Vuitton and Supreme, the case of fashion brands and fashion brands 
or fashion brands and artists collaboration uh, exploded. Um, page five shows recent collaboration between fashion brands and artists. First is Nike and Tom Sack, and second one is uh, uh, Ralph Simon and uh, Sterling Ruby. And, and recently, uh, Long Bang and Gallery Depp, uh, the artist, the ho uh, host, Jose Thomas, uh, their collection was very popular. And uh, lastly, um, uh, Japanese brand uh, Redmade and uh, American artist Kali Thornhill Do It. They uh, made a, a clothing brand Saint Michael um, together. And uh, today, a this brand is really, really popular right now. And um, past the 10 years, uh, US uh, retail market has ex experienced um, new, cha uh, new changes. Young customers shopping habit has been changed a lot because of new technology, such as online shopping. The collaboration between Supreme and Louis Vuitton become, became a social phenomenon. Young generation was crazy about the collaboration, uh, collaboration products. They shared their interest via new media, such as Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and most recently, TikTok. Um, Furthermore, young generation created resale market for this um, product. Soon after this collaboration, the resale market, um, stadium goods, um, grail, stock ads, the real real has been booming. I'm not sure uh, you guys are uh, familiar with this uh, platform, but uh, this is kind of new vintage market. Um, it was very interesting for me because the strategy of selling these products is similar to selling art. Resellers play a role as an art dealer, curator, and um, art historian, and art critic. Um, one of popular collaboration product among resellers is by Virgil Abloh. He uh, collaborated with Nike many times and Supreme, Louis Vuitton, Ikea, Limoire, and many others. His um, fashion products are considered as contemporary artwork. Sadly, he um, passed away at the end of 20, uh, 2020. 2021, but his works are uh, exhibited at the uh, Brooklyn Museum now. He also had an exhibition at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago in 2019 and the Institute of Contemporary Art in 2021. Uh, the Institute of Contemporary Art of Boston in 2021. I think it is a huge achievement of uh, his career. Like. And page seven, you will see the how he cleverly used the same method that art word uses. But the bag, but the bags with sculpture and short, uh, short description of main navel. You guys know about the meaning of soft sculpture and are very used to see the short description title and artist name and year and short description under artwork at a museum or a gallery. And another um, good example of his fashion selling strategy uh, is his store in New York and Chicago. He opened his first fashion store named RSVV Gallery in 2009 in Chicago and his fashion brand, Off White, store's name in Soho, New York, is Amped Gallery. It um, seems that he was trying to manipulate people's fantasy of artwork because buying an artwork is relatively rare and special experience. It is it is only allowed for a limited people. Virgil Abloh is the great example of blurring the boundary of his fashion and art. 
um, as a as I watching the blurring boundary of passion and artwork, I need, I wanted to implement it to my artwork. In 2018, supreme, supreme popularity was at peak. I started visiting a Supreme store and purchased one item uh, every week. And I created my artwork with my shopping experience and materials such as paper races, uh, promotion stickers, final shopping bags and more. So I want to show a uh, little bit of my uh, video. I, um, the consuming memory 12 and consuming memory 13. Um, it, is no, uh, it is no audio, so you can see the only video. Um, Dong Hyu, it's not playing for us. I'm not sure why. I'm not sure why either. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, um, it, it was my short video about my uh, uh, my activity. So I'm, I'm sorry about the. Uh, I'm not. I can't play uh, my video, but it is the act of revisiting the same location every week but on extended period to make a purchase was inspired by the external extraordinary Taiwanese American performance artist, uh, Taching Che. Um, che is known for a series of year long performance that combined art and life. Like uh, Che's work, my art is a, a tribute to everyday commonplace activities and uh, object. Um, this video uh, record, I, uh, I mean, I posted all my activity on uh, Instagram and then I made a uh, video uh, about uh, my, my uh, activity, like visiting what I bought and things like that. So uh, last February, I had a solo exhibition, um, Everything Must Go at Marist College in Park Gibson, New York. Um, so this one is uh, most famous stripes too. These were comprised elastic waistbands and white cotton fabric from men's underwear purchased at the Supreme store in New York City. The cotton fabric and the waistbands uh, which feature the red stripe logo have been uh, hand stitched together. And uh, this one is Shape Up 2. Uh, I found fiberglass statue of Liberty and I covered with a uh, plastic shopping bag. Uh, I think I'm done. So I'm not too sure if my video connection is working, but I want to thank both Don Q Kim and Lisa Rich for such wonderful, engaging um, presentations today about your artwork. I encourage everyone to please um, put your questions in the Q&A on the bottom of your screen so Don Q and Lisa can answer. But to start off um, that process, I have a few questions of my own. And uh, and looking at both of your works, Don Q and Kim, I see some strong commonalities. You both have a love of materials and engagement with materials in unique ways. You use and repurpose, you reuse and repurpose materials. You create the extraordinary in the ordinary through assemblage, collage, composition, stitching, and sculpture. Uh, you exhibit a sense of curiosity and playfulness. You both have an attention to detail. Your hand is evident in the making of your work, and there are elements of magic and mystery. And you both work in areas of fashion design and art, incorporating the garment and costume. And what really struck me forcefully were the strong concepts of identity and communication in both of your practices, and of course, your, how your personal lives um, integrate and inform your artwork. So I'd like to start with Don Q. And we had a little bit of a discussion yesterday, but how does the identity 
How does the idea of identity show up in your artwork? And then I'll ask Lisa the same question. Mm, so we talked a little bit about identity. Yeah, I think identity is very interesting subject because all my artwork tells about my identity and my uh, main medium uh, was the paper receipt. I saved, I collected all my um, paper receipt since I moved to the US, like it was kind of 15 years and I create my artwork with my uh, reset, paper receipts. And it tells about myself, you know, what, who am I and what am I? And um, yeah, so identity is kind of um, my, uh, uh, my main like uh, subject like to create my atwa. Thank you. And you, you did talk a little bit yesterday about how you are an Asian person, mm -hmm. right? Living um, in the United States and, mm -hmm. um, and, and you have this wonderful body of work uh, commenting about the United States mm -hmm. and, and consumerism. So I see that as well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, like, how can, how can I say this? Like, I always admire like um, writers. They, I think they are very good at delivering their thought and emotion. Uh, but I have a, I, I, I always feel that I have a difficulty to communi communicate with uh, people, even in my first language, Korean. But um, in, especially in, uh, USA, I'm not good at speaking English and I'm an Asian immigrant and I have some deep, you know, there's a, there's a um, language barrier. So um, I really want to communicate with, with the other people. That's why I, I start to create my artwork. Like I want to tell my story and my emotion and um, so I think my artwork is kind of a uh, visual language to communicate with other people. That is, that is my strong uh, motivation to create my artwork, to communicate uh, with people, especially uh, American society. Like I'm here, <laughs> I'm invisible, but I'm here and um, I'm living here something like that. I want, I want to talk about, I want to speak about that. Thank you, Don Q. I think you do it really well. And Thank Lisa, you. <laughs> I'd like to ask you the same question. How does the concept of identity show up in your work? Uh, well, it's uh, based on a bit of uh, four prongs, really. I, um, I have a background of early Catholicism, uh, spending a lot of time in churches when I was young, in Catholic churches, which are very sumptuous, very rich colors, jewel tones, uh, embellishments. And I think that my, frank, frank, frankly, my boredom, <laughs> sitting there in that church pew as a small child, I spent a lot of time looking around and really absorbing all of the details of all of those incredible things and the tactility and the beauty of the color. So there was something of that in there. Uh, I also think that um, being in a small Canadian town, I really felt early on that I was a total and complete misfit. I did not fit in. It was really clear. And so I escaped uh, at age 15 to attend Interlochen Arts Academy on that music and music scholarship and ended up in art there. So that's, you know, the kind of the second prong. Um, I'm also legally deaf and I, yeah, there's a lot of information. And on my website, I have a little video that addresses that. But I really do think that um, those experiences, early experiences uh, that I, I 
I had as a child with tactility and with being surrounded by a weeping willow tree, things I've talked about extensively, the It's a Sm Small World ride at Disney, all of those things were really impactful when I was a very young child. Um, so, you know, I think all of those things um, contribute to a sense of my ident identity as someone who loves sumptuousness and sexiness and color and, um, and passionate, love the tactility. And like Don Q said, I'm very interested in communication and in particular my works that are uh, viewer interactive or even just tactile. Uh, they are basically an invitation for people to come into my world. And for me, that's my hug. That's my way of touching them. Uh, and COVID has really put a damper on those viewer interactive works. So I'm, um, you know, looking at, been looking at all kinds of different ways to, uh, to put that, that same communication method forth, forth without so much, you know, so much um, interaction. Thank you. I mean, of, of course, how can how how cannot the personal inform um, your artwork in such a, a significant way? Um, another area we don't have any questions in the Q and A yet, mm -hmm. but um, another area of focus obviously is how you both use materials, and I'm curious um, if you can talk about how materials is a focus in your work. I don't know who would like to take that question. Wow, I think it's, I, I mean, I think it's really strong in both of our works uh, in totally different ways. But for me, um, uh, first of all, it's just the materiality also for me. That's sort of two different things for me. On one hand, I just like materials. I love the feel of them. I love the tactility of them. I want to touch smooth things, nubbly things. Uh, and maybe that's one of the reasons I work with so many different materials is just that what can, what can happen if I put a hard thing with a soft thing? What happens if I take this, the FOSS shape, this car material that was, that's in your car above your head, you know, underneath the header fabric, what happens if I take that? And I heat manipulate that for artworks, you know, that's new and different. I'm really intrigued by that. But on the other hand, it's, um, you know, it's also uh, for me a way to express conceptually. How can I take these materials, which are made by someone else, by a factory or woven by someone else even or printed on, they've, they've experienced a whole other life before they even get to me. And so then I have to take them and I have to change them and alter them to make a statement of my own using things that have a previous life. And, um, and I, I just, I love the um, trying to make things do things that they were not intended to do. And that's a challenge, right? <laughs> that's a problem. A wonderful problem. challenge. <laughs> um, I just want to say, you know, that that all my art career, everyone keeps telling me, oh, Lisa, you've got to stick with one thing, you know, oh, those, those multi panels are so fantastic. Why don't you do those for like the rest of your life? And, you know, I had to come to terms with the fact that I'm not interested in doing that. And that if that means less sales, so be it, you know, um, I am just going to continue to do what I want to do, which someone predicted many years ago in print, that Lisa <laughs> always is going to just do what she wants to do. <laughs> like you're a force to be reckoned with. And then of course, um, where is the fun and the challenge and the sense of curiosity if you're only kind of limiting yourself to one material? But I mean, that, that, that could be a strategy in and of itself. It is. And I and admire then, people that do that. <laughs> and then Don Q, I'd like to offer you the same question about the use of materials. Um, you told us that you use personal receipts. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm really curious, like what, 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 what was your first impetus in the idea? Like, what was the receipt all about for you? Like, what was your discovery? Like, aha, I have this, this really common mundane material and how can I turn it into um, something meaningful for me? Where did that come from? Um, I 
I mean, oh do, my, do you remember yeah. where you got that notion of the receipt? <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, let's say uh, my material tells uh, many story. I use my uh, material like uh, from my everyday activity, like uh, paper resist or shopping bag or uh, face mask. So I want to show that uh, my first artwork uh, made up uh, uh, my uh, paper uh, paper receipt. So can you see my uh, artwork? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, that, that was in a Los Angeles show. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> um, this uh, artwork is uh, the United States of uh, uh, the United of Stitches, and uh, this piece made up um, all my paper uh, paper resist, uh, resist and like um, I uh, wanted, I didn't, I did collect it like all my receipt for any reason. I just keep them like my. For my for myself for just a record and I never thought that I can use this material for my art but um like I said I I tried to find my own digital language so oh yeah it could be my uh, this material can be my uh my thing you know my own thing that's why I start to create my uh, I start to use my uh, everyday material and I show um, another artwork and it is made of a uh, face mask during you know I wear everyday face mask and mm -hmm. can you see this yes yes this is uh, this artwork is made of my uh, face mask and it tells many things. Um, sorry. <laughs> so let's say, uh, let's talk about that uh, face mask. You know, it, it is very personal, personal thing. It is, but, you know, it's just face mask, but uh, during the pandemic, uh, wearing, um, you know, wearing mask is kind of a controversial thing. It became a very political thing. But like, like this, I want to record my time and then I want to talk uh, my comment about, uh, you know, uh, some event or happening around surrounding my environment. It is, <laughs> it and, is, and you do really. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, that's why. Uh, so the material is very important thing to me. Um, it is kind of tool to communicate with other people. It is very common. Uh, it is a very, you know, uh, universal and very trivial thing, but um, everybody knows, and then we can. Uh, easily communicate, easily share our interests with with my art. It does. It does have a great relatability. Mm -hmm. You're right. Mm -hmm. And then there's mm -hmm. also a sense of reading you mm -hmm. <laughs> through your yeah. and and yeah. that sense of vulnerability, putting uh -huh. yourself out there. Uh -huh. um, we do have a couple of questions um, from our Q and A, and I know mm -hmm. that there's a lot of information also going in the chat. Uh, but I'd like to read a question from Laura Rylander um, to Don Q. And she says, um, let's see. I love to see and make art that incorporates the stars and stripes. What is your experience with the public when you use the flag? So do you have any pushback when you use the American flag in your work or have people commented on that? Yeah. Um... Like about that American flag, it uh, tells about my fantasy of American dream or America. 
because I grew up in the 70s and like 80s and the 90s. Um, I'm from South Korea. That at that time, American culture, American entertainment was really popular in my uh, generation. It, and I have some fantasy about, you know, America. So that, uh, that means that my um, American fantasy or uh, uh, glorification of America. So people uh, ask about why use that, that flag, that it is, it is, you know, America is very, very important to my life because I keep uh, using that Makit symbol. Um, yeah, it, it is another exa good example about telling my story. Thank you. <laughs> I think you answered that question really well. Um, and then there's a question about, um, let's see, um, this has to do with the receipts again. This is by Shannon Moulter. Um, she says, it's fascinating to consider your career as a designer and your description of purchases and receipts as a biography. Mm -hmm. And so how does this understanding of what we buy mm -hmm. um, is who we are inform mm -hmm. your designs for working with designing clothes for a market? So mm -hmm. um, does that, does uh, I want to say, does your art practice also then inform your fashion design? Of course, of course. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> like, it, you know, combining fashion and art is a huge trend. And I really want to um, involve the, with that. Like that is great, uh, that is powerful motivation to uh, create my art for me. Like, um, yeah, so, like at some point, I want to combine my art career and my fashion career. So I want to make a profit from <laughs> my art. <laughs> and you, and I mean that is the that is one of the goals, correct? Yes. <laughs> I, yes. I yes. With your audience. Yeah. So I want to people. I want people buy some. You know t-shirts with Dong Yu Gin, like, <laughs> like Alexander McQueen, something like that. <laughs> in the future. In the, in the future, future, in the near future. But um, I think it's really, really hard. <laughs> well, I, I, I mean, you'll get there and I wish you all the luck. And then I'd like to ask Lisa um, the same, same sort of question about, do you, do you have people that come up to you and Talk about your um, your ideas of of the female form and the male gaze and and your use of materials. I mean, you talk about having um, your face and melanoma. Um, do people come up and talk to you about those ideas? Um, not really. You know, not particularly. It's, uh, I, I think that, that um, usually the, the places that I'm talking about my art or I'm displaying my art, uh, you, it's funny because you think that you would get a lot of, a lot more personal questions or deeper questions. But I think in so, social situations, it's more difficult for people to approach you and go that deep to discuss the concepts behind the work. Uh, I think that tends to happen more in an educational setting. So for instance, you know, I've done a lot of lectures uh, when I've taught university classes or just when I've gone to lecture for someone else's class at a variety of, of places and um, or have taught at art centers, et cetera. I think there's a little deeper delve into and people feel a little freer to discuss those things. But 
in a general in a general way no not not too much but but then i can imagine they can enjoy and engage um with the physical um art within the space yes. you know yes yes so they, they can and then and then and that does loosen people up you know there is an advantage for instance to what you do you know um dong that that it, it's accessible to more people and it's more commercial and it's reaching a broader audience and um and i think that what i do tends to be a little less of that that accessibility um i think it's a little more difficult to talk about i agree thank yeah. you I, I i do want to just say one thing about that though um the plastic surgeon who put me back together again with two plastic surgeries, and I, I have to have one more, but um, he had never been to an art show. And I invited him to that art show for my, that addressed my, my, my cancer on my face that he fixed. And he came with his wife and they came in beautiful clothing. They were dressed up for an event. And of course there were just all these different people from young to old and from e in every manner of dress, et cetera. And he and his wife were speechless. They could, mm. they didn't, they, they could not even talk. Because, and he came up to me and said, I just had no idea that artists did this, that mm. artists talked about their work like this through these visual he said i were we just don't even know what to say this is just so affecting us so deeply and um thank you very much for inviting me and i said no thank you for you know making me putting me back together again and making me able to face the world mm -hmm. what, a, what a beautiful connection and you you were the window <laughs> the opening into his into your work um, yes, that's yeah. really beautiful. So we're almost at three o'clock and I wanted to thank both of our presenters today, Lisa Rich and Don Q. Kim for um, opening up your artwork and um, your expressions of it today. Um, I was totally engaged. <laughs> and, well, um, and this has been really great. Thank you so much. Um, the work, the amount, I didn't realize the amount of work that your team, everybody puts into putting these weekly talks together. And I really appreciate all of the help and all of the connection mm -hmm. and everybody just following through and helping us to, to, to do it. And it really takes a lot of work. So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much yeah. for inviting me to like, um, it is great great opportunity to tell my uh, story and my introduce my art to it. Yeah, thank you so much, Carrie. <laughs> thank you um, and, I've, and thank you to our sponsors and to the uh, SACWA for hosting us today. And I want everyone to know that the recording will be available on YouTube in the next week. And also to tell you that next Wednesday, Textile Talks host, um, Al Margen de, la, de las Artistes with Paolo Cramago Gonzalez, um, presented by Sakwa. And again, thank you, um, Surface Design Association and Textile Talks. And hopefully we'll see everybody next Wednesday. <laughs>